At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day and for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial grade supplies for every industry with same day pickup and next day delivery on most orders, all backed by real people ready to help. So you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call, clickgranger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. For the ones who get it done, the most important part is the one you need now. And the best partner is the one who can deliver. That's why millions of maintenance and repair pros trust Granger, because we have professional grade supplies for every industry, even hard to find products. And we have same day pickup and next day delivery on most orders. But most importantly, we have an unwavering commitment to help keep you up and running. Call, clickgranger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Hey, it's your financial maven, Samantha Mittman Besnoff, CPA. And after almost 25 years in the accounting world, I've decided to share my insights and passion about money. Knowing your money and hopefully feeling less stress about your money is what I call being financially empowered. Welcome to the Your Financial Maven podcast. In this week's episode, I have the pleasure of engaging in a wonderful conversation with a dear friend of mine, whom I've known since our son started first grade together. Since then, our bond has grown stronger, fostering numerous meaningful discussions about parenting and our journey through this life. So I felt compelled to invite my close friend, Kristen, to join me in a heartfelt conversation about all things money, and I'm so thrilled that she did. Just so you know, you are the only one I would do this for. <laughs> Good friend. Talk about I know, financial things. I know, and I appreciate things. it. <laughs> well, and it won't be painful. I promise I'm not going to ask anything specific. I was just talking to Les about it last night. I said, you know, all through my 20s, I did all of my finances on my own. I managed everything. Then when we got married, Les kind of just eventually took over everything and he managed the finances and I manage other things like doctor's appointments and other household things. So do you not pay attention anymore? Yes and no. I do pay attention to our checking account to make sure that, you know, there's money there before I spend it. For example, I'm actually on both of my kids' accounts. So if we need to transfer money or something like that, I'm the one who does that. But he's the one that manages all the bills and things. How did you learn about money growing up and what it brought you to, you know, be able to do your own books or understand your money? But then when you get married, what was the reasoning then to switch? What did I learn about money when I was young? Not much. The uh, okay. only thing, honestly, that I remember being taught was how to write a check. I remember being taught how to write a check and to write the information on the line and the checkbook, but I was never taught how to balance a checkbook. I never had any of that from my parents or from school. So how did you learn on your own? Well, I learned just by matching up my bank statement to my checkbook to make sure that everything matched. And if it didn't, then I knew to look into it. I was very conscious of how much money I had. I also waitressed and bartended for a long time. So that involved cash and making sure that I deposited cash into the account so that I could pay bills. Right. <laughs> it's dangerous when it's you know, loose. <laughs> yeah. Um, Although I have to say, I would think now that we have the digital way to pay, I think that's just as dangerous. I agree. I think it's even more so. Because I used to be really good every time I spent something, writing it in my checkbook. Right. Which we're of old school, right? Yes. And when it was just me on the account, it was so much easier too. Whereas, right. I'm sure it was. <laughs> <laughs> once I got married, that just really threw me off because I wasn't used to having somebody else taking money out of the account and not necessarily knowing where everything was going. 
And that really flustered me in particular at first. And I think that really had something to do with why I eventually left kind of just took over doing most of the finances. Now that said, I do have my own savings accounts and I do have some investments that my parents had done for me. So do you feel that your change in having 100% control to giving up some of that control has changed how you guys plan and think about finances? Or do you still have some stress on your end of what is the money coming and going in the house? I definitely still have some stress on that. Mostly when I do want to make a purchase, as I said, when I was doing it all on my own, I knew what I had and what was coming up and where it was going. Whereas now I have to be a bit more cautious because it may be that the money is there at the moment, but if I'm not aware, and this is what I've tried to explain to my husband, if I'm not aware (laughs) of what bills are coming up, then I can't plan accordingly. Now, the fact that he has a very difficult work schedule to match up with, So that's definitely made things a bit more challenging over the years, too, for sitting down and trying to communicate about this. So do you guys budget at all? Yes and no. Not enough. Okay. Okay. (laughs) And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, everybody's situation's a little different. But like you said, if your work schedules are a little off and you can't always sit down to make those, you know, conversations about money, the stress is definitely there. But you, like myself, are going to be empty nesters next year. So hopefully those things will change. (laughs) And I really think that they will more, like I said, I think part of it, the initial reason why we kind of split off and I let him take over the finances, that was something that he could do when he was home at odd hours of the day. And whereas taking care of the kids and running the house were things that had to happen during particular hours. And so since I took on a lot of that responsibility, that was kind of his way of helping. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. I think that's great, be able to divide and conquer. Okay, so let me ask you then, what is money? A necessary evil. (laughs) Ooh, that is a good one. Ooh, Mostly people say it's a tool or a resource, but yeah, necessary evil. I love that. (laughs) (laughs) And I've long considered it that. I think it, it in part because I've never been someone who's aspired to be wealthy. I like that wasn't a goal. However, still in order to be comfortable, in order to, you know, purchase the things you need, you need to have money. And it is important. I agree. But that's a good one, a necessary evil. I mean, you talk about not aspiring to be wealthy, but I think wealth isn't just financial or money, right? We're wealthy in the fact that we are very blessed with our kids, our families, you know, we have roofs over our heads. So we are wealthy in our own right. But I do agree that you do need money to function in society. And I think I probably have a little different perspective on wealth than maybe some people do to my job. Working as a special education consultant, having visited homes of students who live in much different circumstances than I do, that I consider myself to be very blessed, even though we're by no means wealthy, or what I would consider wealthy from my perspective. Right. Very true. Everyone has a perspective of what it means to be wealthy. And how have you and or your husband helped your kids to understand, you know, financial literacy for your kids? Have you done things differently than how you were brought up? You know, and of course, learning how to write a check. Yeah, we've taught our kids with a fifth, sixth grade. What was it? Biz town or whatever it was. But they're not going to need to write checks nowadays. But it's that concept, right? (laughs) Come on. What's a check? like? Yeah, right. (laughs) I know. It's funny. My son is like, checkbook. I don't know where my checkbook is. (laughs) Same with my kids. Oh, my God. So with our kids, one of the things that we did try to do, especially once they reached high school, we did get them both accounts. We got them both a savings account and a checking 
per se. They still call it that, right? It's the checking accounts. In order to help them learn about money, and then we would provide a certain amount of money every so often, but it made them stop and think more when it came time to purchase something or when they wanted something. So if you're just handed the money at all times, then it just seems like it grows on trees. If you actually have to look and say, oh, I don't have enough money to get them or, oh my gosh, this costs. <laughs> I remember my daughter, one of the first times when she got her card and she's like, oh, the dress was $60. Right. So we did that to help them become a little bit more aware. And with my son, we made sure that we helped him establish some credit early on in college. So we got him a credit card that was backed, you know, guaranteed. So we did that with him and he would buy his gas and books, but then he would pay it off so that he was able to establish credit. So he actually right now has very excellent credit, which was helpful when it came time for him to get an apartment because one of his roommates had not done that yet. Larry and I have shared a lot with our kids. They know kind of what we make, what the house costs, and not when they were like two and three, right? Like when they were middle school, high school, and we were getting them set up, we wanted them to have an understanding because we didn't want them to have to do what we did, which was try to figure it out. I mean, not that they shouldn't try to figure it out and stuff like that. So have you talked with them more or is it more just about setting up the checking and savings? I think we are learning as we go. Okay. <laughs> and what I mean by that is we didn't do much of that with Ben. I think we've been doing more of that with Abby, with our daughter, who's younger. So for example, Ben had credit and everything when it did come time to to the apartment, I think he and two of his friends just rented a place for the first time. And it's been very eye-opening to him. Oh, I'm sure it has been. The fact that what it says, this is how much rent's going to be, but you also have to figure in gas and electric and internet and all of these other bits and pieces. And now going from being on the meal plan on campus to... Oh exactly. God, I have to buy my own food, plus gas, plus a little shell shock. <laughs> I'm sure he was. But it has brought us to the realization that we need to do more, that we need to make sure. And I think we had always been very cautious with the kids and not really wanting them to be talking about, oh, you know, this is how much mommy makes. This is how much daddy makes. This is how much, you know. And I think there is something to be said for, I mean, we can teach a lot of things. For example, I know that both kids went through something in high school where they were budgeting and they were given so Yeah, much. their financial literacy yeah, class. Their, yeah, their financial literacy class. But it was still just a game to them. It's still not real. It's just like when people say about you having kids, you don't know what it's like until you're actually there. Very true. But if there's ways to provide the resources and where they can go and the knowledge, I think that's important because I think while schools, some do, some don't do some financial literacy, there's no follow through. And if they go to college or they go out into the real world after they graduate high school, there's nothing there to necessarily give those young adults guidance. And it's important that they understand because they're going to be, you know, taking care of us in a few years, right? So. Exactly. <laughs> But it's not even just about taking care of us. It's understanding the financial side of life. And as we move more digitally, I mean, it definitely makes it challenging. It does. Like I said, the combination of the fact that instead of sitting down one day a month and writing out all your checks and putting them in envelopes and putting stamps on and mailing them and then not necessarily knowing when they were going to be cashed or when they were going to be cashed by who you were sending them to or processed to now it can be immediate. And that's a very different way of thinking about it. But yet we still have some places that we do checks for. Very true. Some places still have checks and cash. But is there any tips or insights that you can give or that you've given to your kids that you can share that, you know, can help others that are out there trying to figure this all out? To continuously be aware of what's in the account and not to spend blindly. 
Credit card debt is another one. I watched a friend in college get in huge debt. She got multiple credit cards because let's face it, they offer them to you at every store you go to practically anymore. And they're not typically very good credit cards either, (laughs) but they kind of lure, especially I think young people in with the idea of, oh, you get 20% off today if you sign up for a credit card and then you'll get our flyers and you'll get extra money off on other things you want to purchase. Right. The coupons yes. and the rewards. Right. And, yeah. and what I watched happen to her is she had so many different store credit cards. And in some cases, she might have only used some of them once, but she still had them. And then it got out of control. And I worried when we first set my son up with his card, he's done very well with it. He's very conscious of it. And I feel my daughter is definitely learning. We will be setting her up with one coming up in the near future. But I loved you had shared with a group of us the other day when you were talking about what you did with your oldest son to establish credit. Yeah, he took out his first year of federal loans. I think it was like the $5,500 first year of the loans for him to take out because we wanted him to have skin in the game. And then we had made the decision not to put him on our cards or do a guaranteed credit card for that first year. So he had a debit card through his bank account, but that first year was kind of a mix. And we made him that summer after his freshman year pay some of the loan back. I think he paid like $50 or $100 back and that established his credit. And You know, he got a credit card. He didn't have a large limit. I think it was like $500. It was a start. And then he started to use it for gas and some minor things. And we're like, you have to remember to pay it back. And as he's been doing it now, I mean, our kids are going to be seniors in college. So he's definitely built up his credit. I know. I can't believe that. (laughs) And it's also, we've taught him how to check his credit because you can go, I think it's three times a year. You can get your free credit report. And so you can do that. And it's important because he's had some fraud on his cards already. And he's caught it a couple of times and I've taught him what to do. Okay, call the bank back. Don't go through the link they sent you. Go to the back of your card, call your bank, tell them that these transactions are not yours and you have to work with them. And they have, but that's what we did to establish his credit on our end. And I thought that was a great idea because like I said, that was never something that I had thought of that I even really realized would be a possibility to establish credit. Well, yeah, I mean, they're paying back a loan, right? So they have a loan on their credit, and now they're showing them that they can pay it back. It's time for a money break. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah. Oh. Sorry, we were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Forward, prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome back from our money break. So another thing I wanted to ask, as women, you know, Women on some level, when it came to their own finances, owning property, getting their own credit cards, you know, a lot of things were late to the game for women to give them rights and things like that. But as a woman, a working woman, a mother, do you feel from a financial aspect, are there any challenges that you've seen as you were growing up or things that you see as a woman when it comes to money that you've seen or been a part of that, you know, we could change it or just things that you might have seen as a woman? I would say... Having more women being familiar and better understanding financial literacy. As I said, I personally know that I still have a lot to learn. I never learned much when I was younger. And I think 
this is kind of going back a little bit to the question you had asked earlier as far as the why did my husband eventually take over finances? And like I said, part of it was situational, but part of it I think was also, that's how it was always done. That's how I remember it growing up too. My dad was the one that handled the finances. My mother handled the house. My mother handled things inside the house. My dad did the outside work. And so that kind of cultural or, you know, expectation that these are the roles that we play. Now, in our case, my husband's schedule, he was driving a truck at the time. That kind of reinforced the need for some of those roles. Right, because you were working full time as well. So during the day, if a call had to be made, it was probably easier for him to make the call than for you to take time from work to do it. So yes, there's definitely that. I mean, we both grew up in that regards of it being old school. But even as a woman, like you said, you did do things on your own. Like when you were in college and before you met Les and married Les, like you had to kind of take that reins. And did you feel as a woman that it was more challenging at that time to do certain things? I definitely think it was less expected. I didn't get married until I was 30. So all through my 20s, I was on my own and managing my own money and my own living arrangements, like everything. I did my own taxes. So I think that it was more challenging the fact that I had never really been taught any of that. When I met my husband and we moved to Lancaster, we still had our separate accounts because we weren't married yet. And I debated, you know, when we got married, we did combine everything, which is fine. But I do most of the books in the house. I mean, Larry has a good understanding and he knows what's going on, but I'm the one that handles it because I can't. Right. <laughs> I guess right. So is there anything else when it comes to money or knowing money or understanding money that you'd like to share any kind of time when there was a challenge? Well, I would say the one other thing that I experienced in particular that was probably very impactful was when my husband and I got married, I had debt from going to get my master's. He was carrying debt from his previous marriage. He and his past wife had gotten pulled into some insurance scam, which was just ugly. So between the two things, we had a lot of debt to the point where we went, and this is going to be shocking to people, credit card free for five years while we paid it off. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's hard, right? It's very hard. The reason why I say it's shocking is because I remember during that time, for example, for work, if I needed to go to a conference or something, we typically, through my job, have to pay for it first and then we get reimbursed after we successfully complete the course or the conference and how challenging that was for me because we weren't using credit cards and they're like, well, you just put it on your credit card. I'm like, you don't understand. That's not an option. Right. It's not an option. Right? So for five years wow. you know, and it was really tough. I'm sure it was. I mean, I remember going to the grocery store and getting to the end of the line and there not being money in the account to pay for the groceries. Oh, no. You know, horrible feeling. But I would also say that people would have been surprised that we were doing that or that we were struggling with that because we were both working. And I think that's a misconception sometimes, too, that people think that if both spouses are working, everything should be fun. But you had debt. Like, if you didn't have that kind of debt, not saying you guys wouldn't have been struggling or had issues. It's a little different when your paycheck is not just going to your basic daily living. You also have to pay off your debt. And how do you balance that? But people sometimes, I think, don't think when they start acquiring that debt as well, how impactful that can be. You're going to have to pay it off at some point. So I think that's a piece that we've been working very hard with our own children to really understand too. You know, that was the reason why I stayed home was because, yeah, we could have put the kids into daycare and I could have worked full time. But for us, we looked at it as, but if I did that, 
we're not going to have anything to put away for savings or help to support this or that because daycare can be expensive. And if you need it, absolutely. Like, I'm not saying not do daycare. I'm saying for our situation, it didn't work. But besides me staying home and making that decision for our family, there were some other things that I did to make sure we kind of knew what was going on. And I would go every month and I look at what bills are due. What's the cash flow, you know, first of the month, middle of the month, end of the month. And then if there's money left over, I do put some away in savings. Yeah. And I have it automatically, like even with my paycheck, it automatically, some of it goes, I have it deposited into savings. You might use it kind of as a backup. Okay. There's something we need to get, or you know, we need to share some money with the kids. But that's smart. You can actually do that with your direct deposit that you can say split it between my checking and savings, do a percentage. And then you know that every month, 10% or whatever's going into savings. That's a great idea. Yeah. And I've done that for a long time. I think I started that after we joined accounts because I felt like I needed one account that I knew what was in there. Well, you know, it's interesting. I had interviewed a couple of enrolled agents, their tax preparers and stuff like that. And the one I was asking her money story about when she was growing up and what did she learn? And she said her father told her to have an FU fund. Yeah. I mean, it was basically a savings account that if more for her because she was a woman that if she needed to leave, she'd have money. But it's just the idea of a savings account. And I've been telling this to people all along throughout the podcast. And when I talk to people, even if you can put a dollar away to get that habit going, put something into savings whatever you can initially, and then build up on that. And like I said, that's kind of like our emergency fund. So the refrigerator goes out, something goes wrong with the car. Although I hope your fridge doesn't since, you know, we just replaced (laughs) it. it. (laughs) I know, knock on wood. (laughs) The joys of homeownership, right? You have to learn to budget and save for things that will break eventually. Unexpected in some cases. So it's things like that that can really throw you off that was the reason I worked out with my own company saying, okay, I want this much taken out every single paycheck. Very smart. Very smart. The other thing is once it's there, then, oh, taking it out is very difficult. But if it never lands in that account in the first place, you just get used to it not being there. You budget on what's there. Yeah. I mean, it's not a bad idea when you get direct deposit to just start with something and put it away. And like you said, no, that's not going to be in your paycheck when you get your paycheck and budget accordingly or spending plan accordingly. Right. We've spent so many years living paycheck to paycheck when that wasn't an option that as soon as it became an option, I'm like, we need to be able to have that buffer because that was the biggest challenge, I think, during those really tight years. I guess I've had that as a peace of mind for so long that Like for me, I can count it. I can see it. It's right there. I know exactly what I have and what I can spend. Is there anything else, any last minute things about money, any tips or tricks or things you'd like to share? I think definitely, you know, teaching kids earlier and like you said, kind of sitting down and sharing more. I think that piece is very important. And it's something that even with just, you know, talking with you as a friend, you know, through our friendship has kind of made me more aware of the importance of that. I think we all tend to be very, I don't want to talk to anybody, but I think it is helpful to reach out when you have friends that do have a deeper understanding of it to really, you know, make use of that, make use of those connections and have them help you think it through. So I appreciate your help. Thank you. Well, this was great. Thank you so much for spending time this morning chatting with your friend. <laughs> you know, and wave hi to me as I scooter by your yeah. house back up. <laughs> I, I, I know I'm that. the scootering accountant. Okay. I want to hear from you. Do you have questions about money? Would you like to share your money stories with me, like a time when you felt really stressed about money? Visit www.yourfinancialmavenpodcast.com and leave me anything you want to tell me about money. The purpose of this podcast is to provide general information on the subjects discussed. It is for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. 
you should consult your CPA, accountant, or tax professional for all of your specific financial needs or situations. Credits. Producer, Your Financial Maven, LLC, and Samantha M. Besnoff, CPA. Music, composition, writing, and recording by my amazing cousin, Dan Shore. Podcast editing by Chris Zarnock of KM Zen Creative. A special thank you to the Seneca Women Podcast Network and iHeartRadio and to PNG and MasterCard for creating and sponsoring the inaugural class of the Seneca Women Podcast Academy. A special thank you to my mentor, Katrina Norvell, for guiding and giving me the confidence that I needed when I didn't think I could do this. A special thank you to all of the women who are also a part of the Seneca Women Podcast Academy. You are some of the most amazing, brilliant, bright women that I know, and I am so blessed to be a part of this group with you. I am so excited for all of your podcasts and where things will go for all of us. And a very special thank you to all of my family and my friends. You know who you are. Without your love and support for me and my life-changing aspirations, I would not be where I am today. Thank you. Your Financial Maven is a production of the Seneca Women Podcast Network and iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, check out the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba Life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. 